morning, good morning, Kingdom Life family. Welcome this morning. Shake off the cares of the week. We are here to praise the everlasting God who is good, who is faithful, who is kind, and who is waiting for you today right here in this room. And for those of you online, we encourage you to stand to your feet and give God all the praise right where you are.
of your goodness forevermore. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus.
as Americans mean something. Around the world, wherever we go, they say, where are you from? And you go, oh, I'm, I'm an American. And do you know what comes with that? What comes with that is everything that America has ever been. So if they've had a good experience with America, then you were the land of opportunity. You're where hopes and dreams go to reside and to become recognized. But if they've had a negative experience with America, then you're everything that's ever been wrong with the world and capitalism. See, what I'm about to say is not a political statement. It's a statement of reality. When you say that you're Lord and I call you Lord, then everything that has ever been associated with him is now associated with me. Everything that he's ever conquest, everything he's ever won, every battle he's ever fought, his history becomes my identity. Now what do we do with that, church? See, the history, the song before said, he has no rival. He has no rival. So whenever something is fighting me, I must have forgotten my identity. I must have to go back and remember his history. Because when depression rises up, I know that Lee's fighting, not Lord. When I feel there's a lack, I know that Lee's fighting and not Lord. And so church, I want to remind you right now, whose you are. These songs are more than just to get you going and make you feel good. But these are songs about who you are, who he's called you to be, who he's asked you to do, what he's done for you. And so God, today we respond with a yes. God, we respond with yes. We, we don't know what the yes is even. We know that yes is for now, but yes is also for later. God, we thank you that even in this moment of yes, that you've been able to go back into time and restore everything that's been taken from us. Every premise right now is unlocked with a yes. With a yes. You said the answer to prayer would be yes and amen. So God, let it be done. Let it be done, God. We don't, we're not silly to think that it's just magic or that we don't have a part in it. But God, today in this moment, right now in the room and online, wherever you are, we pray right now. We pray right now that you recognize your identity is in his history, which means your future is tied to his future, and you've already won. The end of the story is that we win, church. The end of the story online is that we win. We win now and then forever. Now and forever. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Will you look before you have a seat and just give a high five, a head nod to another winner? Someone else who said yes, someone else who is part of our story. Oh my goodness. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? All right, all right. Well, my name is Minister Lee, and I'm one of the ministers here at Kingdom Life. It is a pleasure to get to welcome you. So listen, if you're here for the first time, here's what I would like you to do. There's going to be a number on the bottom of the screen. If you can text that number, text the word guest to that number. If you're here in the room online, that goes for you too. So if you're here for the first time, uh, if you're tuning in for the first time online, text the word guest. We want to get to know you. We want to hear your story. We're interested. How did you find us? What's going on in your life? Now, if you're here in the building at the end of service, we do invite you to join us in our guest center, which is on my right, on your left, uh, as you as you exit the uh, sanctuary. That's not true at all, because your left would be that way. So it would be on your right as you walk out, because you got to, unless you're walking backwards, then it's different. But... It's going to be the guest center is over there on that side. We cannot wait to meet you. We have a gift for you. We love you. Can we just give it up for the guests that are here and online? We just thank you. We thank you so much for, for worshiping with us. Now, this week, we have some things coming up. So, ladies, I'm not good enough to be a DJ, but I've always kind of wanted to do that. So, let's do it again and then make me feel good, right? Ladies. Ha! <laughs> DJ Redbeard up in the peace. All right. Well, listen up. Listen up. 
this Friday, this Friday, we have uh, an opportunity to come together and to gather uh, with all of our women are invited to a ladies' night. Uh, we're going to come together. They're going to do, uh, they're going to make some, some floral arrangements. It's going to be a really good time. I'm saying that. I'm not going to be there, but I'm going to hear all about it. We're going to watch it on, online. But listen, here's the deal. There is a small fee associated, but we don't want that to be the thing that holds you back. So if uh, that fee is in any way, gets in your way, Minister Lone will be right here in the front, and she promises that nobody, nobody will be left out. So please, uh, if you're available this Friday night at 7.30, this Friday night at 7.30, right here in the building. Sound good? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Now listen. Uh, typically, uh, if you've been following with us, you've heard that uh, over the, this past year, really in the beginning of the year, we've been talking about partnering with an organization called the Lewis Palau Organization. And we've been working on City Fest, which is fast approaching. Now, here's the deal. We're getting now into the fun part of City Fest. And so what that is, is now it is time to prepare ourselves for the harvest. What that means, if you're not a church person, is we are, being pre we are preparing ourselves to see an answered prayer, right? It's one thing to pray. It's another thing to prepare for the answer to that prayer. I'm not preaching today, so I'll leave that there. But that being said, right, that being said, here's what we want to do. We are looking for people who will be ready to serve those that respond to the gospel message, that respond to the message of salvation in the park um, uh, later on in, in August, August 27th and 28th. So what we're doing is we are looking for festival friends. Festival friends are people that we will train up, you will be equipped, you will be uh, strengthened, you will be put out with everything that you need to make this thing happen. And uh, uh, statewide, we're looking for 2,000 uh, festival friends. We're believing for at least that many people to come to the Lord uh, during City Fest. So here's what we're asking of you on July 15th is a Friday night. We are going to open up this place at 730. If you have a desire to minister the gospel, if you have a desire to pray with somebody, if you have a desire to be part of somebody's story, part of the story of what God is doing, not just here, but what God is doing forever. If you want to be part of that, we ask you to come on down. All you have to do is show up. You don't have to register. There's no cost. There's no fee. Come on down. Uh, get plugged in. Uh, it, it'll be about an, uh, uh, probably about 90 minutes or so, but it'll be a fantastic time. You'll have everything you need, all your questions answered. And so if that is you, if you are excited about seeing someone's life change the same way that your life has been changed, then would you consider coming out? All right, all right, all right. So we're going to get ready to do, uh, to take up the Lord's offering. And so here's what I want to do first. I want to get the logistics out of the way. And so if uh, there's a, a variety of ways that you can give, uh, you can text the word give uh, to the number on the bottom of the screen. You may choose to just use the app and hit the, the, the give tab there. Uh, here, certainly here in the building, in just a moment, the, the buckets will go around with the ushers. Uh, you can do that. You can also uh, mail in. <clears throat> you can mail it into the main office. All of that stuff is up there and the logistics are there. And uh, the truth of the matter is, if you really wanted to do it, you'd do it, right? Just, just like we all do, right? If I really want to do something, I'm going to do it. But here's what I want to talk about today. There was a scripture that I bumped up against, right, in, uh, in Deuteronomy. It says this. It says, when you come to the Lord's house, don't come empty-handed. Now, let's be fair, right? I am absolutely pulling that out, uh, not because that is the way we should understand it, but I'm pulling it out because it made me think of something. Years ago, my grandfather... Uh, he used to be the party house. Does anybody ever hear the party house? Well, all the family parties are at your house. I'm saying hands go up and heads go down. That's really funny. That's really, oh yeah, it's us, right? My grandfather used to have the party house. He had a swimming pool. He had all these things. Now, as a kid, you're small, so you think everything is big. But as you grow up, you realize that he only had a house that was like 1,100 square feet, one bathroom, and there would be 30 people every weekend to come, Right? So here's what my grandfather used to tell me. He said, you know what would make me happy? Yeah, when people got there, it was a good time. They'd knock on the door, and, and my, my grandmother's name was Marie, and they'd go, Marie, your family's here. He said, but when I heard this sound, he said, that would make me happy. I'm like, Pop, why would that make you happy? I don't understand. He said, Lee, if they're kicking the door, then their hands are full. 
He said, if they're kicking the door, then their hands are full. Now, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing about that statement. That statement is not to say, my grandfather became a hot dog horde and just loved to have everybody's hot dogs and nobody can have the hot dogs. What my grandfather did is when you came to the house, whatever you brought, he would then prepare so that we all could enjoy it. He didn't take from you so you didn't eat. He didn't take from you so then you can go without. My grandfather took it and prepared it and then passed it for all of us. Now, my grandfather was a great man, one of my favorites, but he's not my God. He's not my, he's not my father father, right? He's just my grandfather. So let me tell you about what your heavenly father does. It may not be one to one. You may not get two hot dogs because of what you brought. You may not get the, you may not get a piece of the pie that you brought. And I don't know how it works, right? This is what a metaphor breaks down. But here's what I know. I know that God throughout scripture continues to remind us that he sees us. He grieves with us. He's aware of us. And, and, and what the, that scripture says is you bring your gift based on how dependent you were on God for the season that was ahead. And so I want to challenge you, church, but I don't want to challenge you because that sounds aggressive. I want to invite you. I want to invite you into what God is doing. I want to invite you into what God is doing and, and how God blesses those and blesses us around. So today as you're preparing your offering, I would ask right now that you would just look inside, ask God, during worship, it was easy to say yes. Oh man, when we were worshiping, it was great. Minister Jason and the team, and it was incredible. And then it was so good that no matter whatever Lee said, it couldn't have been bad because it was great. Like, not because he was talking, but because the spirit was moving. But now here comes the ask. And what do we do when God is asking us to respond to the yes that we already gave? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for everything that you do all that you are and all that you've given. Father, none of this is lost on us. We recognize that we are more dependent on you than we're even comfortable, uh, than we're even comfortable enough to admit. We recognize we don't wake ourselves up. We don't give ourselves bread, breath. We don't give ourselves thoughts. But God, that is all you. So Father, today we ask that you do what, with what, what only you can do. We give you our gifts. We respond in obedience. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful service.
church. How are we today? Online, good morning, welcome. Happy 4th of July weekends. Did you guys get your uh, hamburgers and hot dogs already? Ready for the cookout? Looks like some people already left for it. <laughs> but happy 4th of July weekends and I just want to say that, uh, man, it is an uh, honor and a privilege to, to celebrate the 4th of July, regardless of our background or experiences. The way I look at our country and even the history in which we celebrate, and there's going to be a screen that uh, goes in the back of me soon that shows 
you know, just all different images of the history of, of our country is that <clears throat> a lot of people dis kind of disassociate or disvalue Christianity not because of what Christianity is or what they, it's about and what it is at its core value of. They discredit it because of people that, and what they've done in the past and what they've done supposedly in the name of Jesus. Does that make sense? And so we get caught up and we do the same thing with our country. We would disqualify because, man, did, you know, this is what happened here. This is what happened here. This is how they treated women. This is how they treated African Americans. This is how they treated, you know, indigenous people and, and completely understand. But it's on the basis of what was written on that Declaration of Independence that tied so closely to the heart of God for this world and for people. When they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with a certain unalienable rights that among, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we are getting better and better and fighting for that. And it's the reason why when it comes to Christianity, I might slip up. We as a church might not be perfect. You might even make some mistakes. But it doesn't taint who God is Amen. and what the Bible is. Does that make sense? Amen. So we celebrate the 4th of July because of the promise, because of the hope and the faith of the very things it was founded on that we will never let go of. Amen? Amen. Amen. And with that, I want to continue this morning on the word that I started last week on image bearers, on being an image bearer. So image bearer, we talked about last week how we are all created in the image of God. That... There is such a sacredness to being human, to being a human being that God breathed his breath and created us in his image with his spirit, with his life beating in our hearts, his breath in our lungs. The Bible says before we were born that he knew us, that he knit us together in our mother's womb. He knows the hair on our heads. He knows our plans, our purposes, our future, and that he didn't just do it so we can just do whatever we want in life, but we, he did it that we may step in as sons and daughters of the king and represent him and be an image bearer and have the true life that we were created to. Today I want to continue on that thought. And I want to go back to two weeks ago because two weeks ago we talked about on Father's Day of when Jesus was baptized. And it was such a powerful, powerful moment. It's when the heavens, the Bible says, tore open. Man, they just kicked it open, and the heavens opened, and a dove came that represented the Holy Spirit and rested on Jesus. And God declared to Jesus and to all humanity, he said, you are my son. You are loved, and I am well pleased. He said, I claim you, I love you, and I praise you. That's what God spoke to his son, Jesus. And it's what God speaks to all of us. But on the flip side of I claim you, you belong and you have your identity in me. 
You are loved and cherished and cared for. You are praised and esteemed. And I'm proud of you. On the flip side of that, what happens to a person that doesn't belong? That grows up without an identity. That grows up without a name, without a father. That grows up that's not loved. That might even be abused and forgotten. That isn't praised or esteemed or lifted up, but it's torn down. And never mind what happens to one. What happens to a world? To millions and millions of people that aren't claimed, that are forgotten, that aren't loved, that aren't esteemed. See, this is what the true ministry of reconciliation is. This is why we are an image bearer. Because there is a gaping hole. There's a heart-shaped hole in the hearts of millions and millions of people around the world that they don't feel they belong or claimed or belong or they have an identity and they don't fit in. They don't know what love is. And they definitely are not lifted up or praised. I could even, if I wanted to, go into it, but it will just be too much and too heavy to go into how when these things are absent, the abuse and the destruction in society of people and the desperation and the isolation and the depression and the longing and the choices we make to then fall into the hands of the enemy and the ways of this world, it's too much. But God has a plan. And God said, man, it's not just me or my son. I called you to the ministry of reconciliation. I call all of you to be my image bearers. If you are to talk to people that are on the front line, the strongest advocates in the United States for pro-life or the pro-life associations, they would say that the work is just starting today. They are anticipating that there's going to be thousands upon thousands, if not millions, of babies that are not chosen, that do not belong, that are not loved or esteemed or praised, that will now be in foster care. And they're saying, now the church needs to respond. The church needs to step up and now be the hands and feet that God's calling us to be. Not just fighting for what we would call a moral cause, but now to actually do something. And I can go and say, man, from birth to the grave, there are the orphans and the widows that the Bible talks about that are in need of belonging, of being chosen, of being loved, of being praised and esteemed. And the question is, what are we going to do? Will we dare to be the image bearers that literally follows the word of God that literally follows the heart of God by the power of the Holy Spirit through Christ Jesus and bring belonging and love and praise to a world that is longing and dying for it and going into all these different areas and places trying to get that answer 
So with that being said, let's get into the word. In Micah, verse 6, I mean, in chapter 6, verse 8, it says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In other translations, it says the Lord requires you to do justice. Micah 6 is... It's, it's a fascinating chapter. Basically, the Lord puts his people on trial. He said, Micah's going to be my prosecutor. The mountains in the ancient of days will be the jury. And I accuse you of not loving and caring for your brothers and sisters and for being so selfish that you only care about yourself and you've denied your relationship with me that I've longed to have and you've thrown out my precepts and my laws and my ways and you've just done your own thing in your own way. And they respond, God's people, in verses four and five and he says, they're like, God, what can we do to make this right? And God's answer to them is not about what you think or about getting yourself together and following laws. He said, you want to know what you can do to get it right? Do justice. Love mercy and walk humbly. God, to do justice to care, to have empathy and compassion for those around us, for those around me, and to not just push it off on somebody else. Oh, that's the church, and the church needs to do something. Oh, that's the government's role, and the government needs to do something. Oh, that's the school, and the school needs to do something. All those things are true. Every organization, an entity that represents people should be driven by these three things, whether they're secular or not, whether they're godly or not. But individually, God is speaking to us to do justice. To love mercy. Not just... To, not just to do mercy, to actually love mercy. That means when somebody is guilty and deserves something, we pardon them. Yes. We step in and we cover them with love. And we say, even though you deserve it, we're not going to heap it on you. Because that's who God is. That's what God's done for us. We receive mercy. What does Micah 6, 8 really look like? I'm going to give you scripture because I don't want you to think this is my opinion. I talked about that last week. Scripture in the heart of God, in the plan of God, is all we want. It's all we want to know. It's all we want to receive. It's all we want to walk in here at Kingdom Life. And whether we're like the Israelites or whether we're like generations in this country and we slip up and we fall and we don't represent what was written down, what we stood for, we get back up. We dust it off and we receive the mercy of God and then we extend the mercy of God. And that's why we walk humbly. Isaiah 1 verse 16 says, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. When he says, take your evil deeds out of my sight, he's not saying, get out of my face. He's saying, get that evil out of my face and you stop doing wrong and learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. This 
is a thread, if I had time, can go throughout scriptures from the Old Testament all the way to the New, through chapters and books, to see the heart of God, to understand mercy, to understand the Jubilee, to understand even written in God's law in the Old Testament were these acts of mercy that he required his people to have even to strangers. And this isn't an Old Testament idea because God wants us to move from just listening to actually doing. He wants us to get to a place that, no, no, what I want you to do is to not just listen, not just hear, but to do something with it. That's why the words of James echoes and reverberates within the church, within the believers, heart and mind to this day. Let's read James. Turn to James 1, verse 19 says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. (laughs) This is a message in of itself. And it's a side point to this message. Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Quick to do what? Share your opinion. Quick to do what? Tell people what they're doing wrong. Quick to do what? Judge others and condemn them. And throw the first stone. No, 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 no. That's not the heart of God. Jesus is the greatest example of how he walked on this earth for us to follow. How he was so quick to listen to the people around him, even to the religious people's dismay. He was willing to sit down with the tax collectors or the harlots and the sinners and the leopards and listen to hear their story to understand them and where they're coming from and not to then bring judgment on them to hear their story and say, okay, here is what now I decree, but to love them. In the response of love, think about the person you love. It's amazing what I was willing to do for love, how much I was willing to die to self in order to love my wife the way I needed to love in a marriage and how God was calling me to love. I had to put aside my own desires, my own needs, and not that I just threw them all out, but those became now secondary. And love transformed my heart and my life and my actions and how I spent my time and what I did with my time and who and all. It transformed it all. Not because I had to, you know, fill in the holes or do it. It was because I was compelled by love. It's amazing when you love people, how they are compelled to react. And we see people, tax collectors and fishermen and sinners and prostitutes and all these compelled by the love of Jesus to turn, to walk away from a lifestyle of a world way and a world order that never brought fulfillment and to turn because they saw the genuineness, the real article, not the counterfeit and not just the religious mindset. We need to come back to that in order to be an image bearer, we need to walk in the steps of Jesus. And I don't say that in a religious way or just in a hokey way of saying we need to choose these things. So when he says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, 
Just think, how many of us become angry because of righteousness? What do I mean by that? How often, because of truth, because of the word of God, because of the morality we believe that God wants us to live by, and how others do not follow that truth in those ways according to what we know God says, we become angry and violate the very heart that God wants us to have. That's why last week I said the right thing, the wrong way is the wrong thing. The right thing, the wrong way is the wrong thing because it won't bear fruit. That's why the Holy Spirit, discernment, wisdom, and that's why the fruit of the Spirit but that's another message. Verse 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do not just listen, but do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. See, if I'm chosen and I belong, and I have an identity. I look in the mirror, and I know who I am. I know what I see. Flaws and all, but I know the image bearer I'm called to be, that you're called to be. That's why humility is so important, because we will fall short, and that's why the mercy isn't just what we give to others, but what we continue to receive. But let me continue. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law, which is the word of God through Jesus Christ, that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. This is how we're blessed in fighting for a cause. This is how we're blessed and have fruit in relationships that are in our lives. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. You know why I love this scripture? Because it preaches on its own. Yeah. Just read it again. And it's like, oh, woo! Woo, I gotta go delete some of my posts right now! I'm making believe I'm reading the word, but I'm deleting. Come on, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy. That's my encouragement to delete those posts right now. Go ahead. No shame. Every single one of us have to do it for the most part. <laughs> you still think I'm playing. I'm going to pause so you can take some time. Consider what I'm asking from you. And then it says, so it basically says, on one side, religion that's worthless. This is what he's saying. James is telling us, you want to know religion that's worthless? It's religion that just talks, talks, talks. It just hears, 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 and then talks, 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 and then thus everything comes out of their mouth, and they just tear down, and they don't build up. They don't effectively communicate. They don't bear fruit, okay? And this is useless. It's like somebody that forgets, looks in the mirror and forgets what they look like, forgets what God called them to be. And then he says, now let me show you what real religion looks like, what real faith, being part of a church truly is. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. And he brings up two things. The first, he brings up the words of Isaiah and the words of Micah and of other prophets from the Old Testament. He says, to look after orphans and widows in their distress Religion that's pure. 
He says, you got to do something. And what am I going to do? To look after widows and orphans. Oh, God, you're asking too much. But is he? He's saying, the very thing that I did, and I spoke into my son, when I told him, you are my son, you belong, you are loved, you have a home, and I am pleased, I have praise for you. He's saying, I want you to do the same. My sons and daughters, I didn't just speak this to Jesus. I spoke it to you. And now that you've accepted that, I need you to now go out and be my hands and my feet. To look after orphans and widows and to keep oneself from being polluted from the world. This polluted is a spot. The word is spotted as a stain. When we get, we're stained by the, and it has different connotations, but the number one thing is how we now understand we're polluted by a worldly view, a mindset that we even filter the word of God through this worldly view instead of through his eyes. So we'll take something that's righteous and then engage in a world the way they do with it as if we can fight it to establish. When Jesus said, no, 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 I'm not going to do it like the Pharisees. And no, 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 I'm not going to do it like the zealots. I'm going to do it this kingdom way. And this kingdom way is to love and to extend mercy and to actually care and listen to people, and to engage with people you don't have anything in common or that disagree with the way you think and believe and live. But you have something. It's the spirit of life. It's the Holy Spirit that I put in you that you will be able to share this, and it will bring hope, and it will bring restoration, it will bring healing to a world that's dying and longing for it. Please, don't step in the shoes of the zealot that's trying to fight Rome. And please, don't try to step in the shoes of the Pharisee that's just going to get entangled with the law and morality and just cut its simple slice and compromise with the, you know, with the world order and try to then change. No, no, don't do any of those things. Come right here. And this isn't something that was lost on the early Christians. When we look at Rome, Rome was a mighty, mighty empire, the greatest, arguably, in the history of the world. 2,000 years ago, they had roads and infrastructure. They had running water from aqueducts that came into homes. They actually had hot water 2,000 years ago. Homes, not all of them like ours, the rich and the well, well out, but they had hot water in their homes. They had social services. They actually had a welfare system. They had things like a newspaper and a libraries. They were incredible, way ahead of their time. After the fall of the Roman Empire, we, didn't see, we went to the Dark Ages. We didn't see anything like it until the Renaissance. They had a city of over a million people. We didn't see a city of that size being able to have sanitation and all these other things until London in the 1800s. Why do I say all this? Because the Romans cared for their people. If you were a Roman citizen... Man, you were protected underneath their law. And man, they had what they believed a superior way of living for society. 
that cared, that all the other barbarians and the other tribes and nations knew nothing about. And that's why they would come in and oppress because they, they're so primitive. And I'm not saying that's right. It was wrong. But here's my point. Then Christians came and they started to use them. They started to oppress them. They started to kill them. They started to put them into games for eaten by lions and all of these things. But then the Christians started living out a life. They started to believe what Jesus actually taught and what the Bible said and what the word of God was in his example. And they started living it out. And the Romans couldn't deny the fruit of these believers. They couldn't deny what they were doing. You want to know what they were doing? They were taking care of the widows and the orphans. Places where the Christian community was habited in different cities throughout the Roman Empire. They saw crime going down. This is all documented. I'm not making this up. They saw crime go down. They saw welfare levels go down. They saw a transformation in the people. They saw people that actually cared for others that weren't their race, that weren't their same citizenship. And they were like, wow. They couldn't deny it. And the Christians at that time weren't trying to change Roman legislature. They weren't trying to overtake the Rome. They were trying to live out the kingdom of God on this earth. And what happened was the very emperor of Rome took notice and made Emperor Constantine in the 4th century, 300 years, 350 years later after Christ was crucified, ended up making the Roman Empire's national religion, Christianity. How? Why? We have so much to learn from our first and second and third and fourth generation of Christians that followed the teachings of Jesus and the apostles and lived out a lifestyle we are so compromised by the culture and the world around us. We don't even realize when it says don't be polluted that we are filled with spots because our, the way we see isn't even through the lens of the kingdom. It's time for us to be image bearers. It's time for us. And it's not, listen, I am praying oh, we're going to have and we have had and we will continue to have from Bishop and Janine to our pastors and ministers on our knees in meetings talking it through of what's the changes, what are the shifts, what's the new focuses, how do we do these things in a better way. That is absolutely a fact. But that is not the key for you and your life and the people that are in your life. I'm telling you. We have so much power and authority in our hands. None of us are hopeless. None of us. To be hopeless is to be without Jesus, is to be without the presence and the spirit of God in us. If we have Christ, if we have this presence and the spirit of God, then hope is alive Hope is alive. We have a plan and a purpose, and God wants us to be image bearers. You can do it. Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about that. Because what's amazing, you would think that the greatest empire that now comes and gets away of all the false gods or the self-indulgent you know, indulgent gods like the Caesar, Augusta knows, calling themselves gods and thinking they're God alive. They get rid of all that and they come over here and they embrace Christianity and they bring it in now to the kingdom. You would think, this is it. The Roman Empire is going to be greater than ever. 
Correct? Wouldn't, that, wouldn't you think that would be the case? Anybody, online, they're over here, they're either enthralled by what I'm saying or they're just, you know, thinking about cheeseburgers. So online, okay, what do you think would be the natural circum- what would unfold with this mighty, powerful empire that now embraces Christianity as their own? Wouldn't it explode? Wouldn't it become now the greatest nation, the greatest empire of all time? But you know what happens? The opposite. The Roman Empire. Why? Why didn't we believe Jesus when he was tempted? And he sat there and the enemy said, here are the kingdoms of this world. Rule these. And he said, and Jesus said, yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> That's not my kingdom. And he offered them every kingdom. From the Roman kingdom to every kingdom and nation that would follow those that we don't even know yet. If the world is still, humanity is still on this earth a thousand years from now, and there's nations or empires that come about, whatever it is, Jesus knew about them. The enemy tempted him with all of it. And Jesus said, no, because I have a kingdom. And this is where we find our true identity. This is where now I, I, this is where I belong. I truly, truly belong. Above my heritage. I don't discount my Italian heritage. I embrace it. I love it. Okay? Those in here, you have absolutely. But man, I am a kingdom child. You are sons and daughters of the kingdom of God that calls you to be an image bearer. It's not a question of choice. It's a question of identity, of who you were called when you were in your mother's womb, knitted together by God, sacred and set apart. He said, I give you life and breath to be an image bearer for me. Now the question is, do I want to walk out my true calling, my true identity, or do I want to be polluted by the things of this world, just be hearers and never be a doer? I wrote here, I just got to read this. James breaks down the real ministry. Real ministry is responding to the authentic needs of others with the love of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. True ministry, true religion, being part of the church means we respond to the needs of others. That is what the church, that is how it exploded. That's how it took down the greatest empire of all time. Not with sword and might, not with argument, not with a dissertation, not with posts, but with love and action. We're counted in the hearts because God cares for all people, all flesh. He's pouring out his spirit on who? All flesh. On his sons and daughters. And he's asking us to be with him. 1 John 3.16 says this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Let that sink in another one of those scriptures that preaches by itself. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth. How do we know that we belong to the truth? How does God know that he says, you belong to me? How does he call us sons and daughters when we live this out and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence? This is the word of God. 
See, real love is 1 Corinthians 13, but put it now through what I'm saying and hear these words. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Those are the attributes. If we truly love the world around us, if we love the people, if we love society, if we love our family and friends, if we love the lost, if we love those that are in pain and hurting, that are abused and have been abused, this is now who we are. In verse 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. I want to do a little, I want to do a little uh, object lesson with you as we close out today's service. If you were to put the lights on in the house, I want us to see each other's beautiful faces. All right? So here's what we're going to do. If you were born in 1973, and this is going to take full crowd participation, okay? <laughs> full crowd participation. If you were born in 1973 like me, stand on up. Anybody born in 1970? My man, look at you. Looking good. Whose birthday? Oh, happy birthday. Woo. See, we celebrate each other. That's the kingdom. All right. Now, in this, no, stand up. Stay standing. Stay standing. You're not going to sit down until we are completed here. So what I want you to do is because along with me, you are the only person that is reconciled to Jesus Christ in this room. It's just us. Look at the rest of the world. Lost. Waiting for somebody. Waiting for something. Searching. Hurting. So here's what you're going to do. Because you're called image bearers. I want you to choose two people to stand with you. Choose two people, any people. Go ahead, right now. Two people. Just touch them, let them stand. Go ahead, two people. Make sure you touch them. Touch them. All right. Now you're part of the kingdom. Welcome to the kingdom. We've been waiting for you. You're beautiful. But now if you just stood up, I want you to touch two people. If you just stood up, I want you to touch two people. Don't wait. Come on, quick. Stand. All right. Now here's the thing. See, God calls us to be in community. God calls us to be his hands and feet. So now do me a favor. Okay? If you just stood up, I want you to touch two people. Go ahead, touch two people. Come on. And here's the deal. If you get, if somebody touches you and you stand up, I want you to touch two more people. Go ahead. Let's do this quick. If somebody touches you, stand up and then touch two others. There you go. Keep it going. If you were just touched and you stood up, look at this. The kingdom of God is advancing. Look at this. Come on. Listen, don't stop. We're not going to stop until everybody is standing. Until everybody. If you see one person, st don't stand up if nobody touches you. Don't stand up if nobody touches you. Some of you might not get, need to get out of your seat. Do I see anybody? Oh, there's a couple back there. Look, they lead in worship and they need to get saved over there. All right. All right. Anybody else in the back? Is there anybody sitting down next to you? Can I tell you something? Listen. Look around. We started with like six people. All right. But now listen, listen. Here's the point. This is how the kingdom truly advances. Listen, we might have City Fest in August, and it's going to be incredible. But if it's not because of personal, personal connection. See, because when that person stood up, they wouldn't just stand up because they're like, hey, somebody touched me. It's because you started talking to them. It's because you had a relationship with them. It's because you saw a need, a hurt, an abuse, and they trusted you. 
with the things that they're going through, with their doubts and with their pain and with their confusion and with the hypocrisy they may have seen in church before and they let you and they opened up. And then you didn't give them mumbo jumbo. You didn't just give them some religious answer. You didn't say, hey, come to church, you know. You said, no, no, no. Church is powerful. But let me tell you about a man. And then with their doubts, with their morality, with their societal issues, all those things, you start having real conversations. And you start wrestling it through. And before you know it, the kingdom of God is advancing. See, if we just get stuck into just coming to church and just hearing and hearing, and then at the very, (coughs) the most we do is we'll just share stuff. We'll just post stuff. We'll just declare stuff, which declaration is a powerful part of the kingdom. But if we are absent of the doing, because guess what? You know who's represented in this crowd? Our widows, our orphans, our people that, can't pay bills, those that are dealing with trauma and depression and anxiety, those that are shy or selfish or stuck in some type of bondage or just hungry to hear the good news. They've been searching, looking all over the place, but haven't met a man. See, will we be an image bearer? Because this simple exercise, as simple as it is, this can be the reality for the houses on your street, for the people that you work with, for your friends at school, for your enemies online or the people online. Instead of just jumping into the fray, of nonsense and just bittering back and forth and just causing more separation and more division in this world, we can be salt and light. See, that's why when we made a call and said, oh, we're doing life groups. And some people understand. I see my girl Sonia right there where she was like, I'm not just waiting for people from the church to sign up to my life group. I'm inviting my friends from my block, from my street, And they're going to come into community. I'm going to do community with them. And she saw it as a pure, real evangelism. Where's Ida? Where's Ada? She's downstairs. She's serving. My girl Ada. We're doing every, I mean, um, Alpha. She did Alpha. Guess what? She tasted and experienced something. And she's like, no, 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 no. My husband coming, okay? My family coming. My friends are coming. Now she's running a group right now with like seven or eight people that don't even go to this church. How is that possible? Is it because she has some special anointing on her life? Yeah, the special anointing is the love of God and actually believing in what he says and doing something with it. So this is it. I'm going to leave you with one scripture, and it could be kind of harsh, but hear me out. This is now Jesus. We talked about Old Testament. We talked about James. But listen to what Jesus says. Jesus talked about what you do to the least you do to me. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, He will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the worlds. For I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Because he's basically saying, you cared, you loved, and you did something. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see the hungry and feed you? 
or the thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger invite you in or need in clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the one, for the one, the person living right next to you for the last 15 years, The person in that cubicle right next to you. That locker that gets on your nerves. She gets on your nerves so much right next to you in school. The person right next to you in church. That today is their first Sunday. And you decided to introduce yourself and invite them in to family. When did you do this? Then the Lord will answer, Lord I lost him. A stranger did it. I need the clothes and blah, blah, blah. I was sick. Then the Lord will answer in verse 44. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick in prison and help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for me, I skipped a whole bunch. I went to the second section. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. And then he said to the goats, he said, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. They say, Jesus, when did we see that? And he says, what you didn't do for the least. Jesus is saying, my kingdom is about doing. It's not about waiting for legislation, legislature to change. It isn't about the church to come up with a new program. Those things will happen, may happen, do happen, all of that stuff. But they're saying, oh, no. There's widows, there's orphans, there's everybody in between. There's this thing from from the belly to the grave, which is called all of humanity, that are longing to be with one another, connected to one another, cared for one another, and transform this world to be the hope of Christ Jesus and to truly represent his kingdom. I don't know about you, but I'm all in. I don't know about you, but I can take the first little step. So if that's you today, grab the hand of the person next to you and let's pray. Let's pray. And when I say let's pray, I mean you bow your head, close your eyes, and start praying. God, what could I do? God, how could I make a difference? Who's the one person? Jesus, show me the one person that's thirsty, the one person that's hungry, the one person that's lost in my sphere of influence. The one person I could reach out to. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. And we're not perfect. So, we need your mercy. And we walk humbly. But Lord God, just like you told the Israelites through the prophet Micah, just like Jesus shared in his whole entire ministry for three years, just like Paul and Peter and James encouraged us to do, to be your hands and your feet. I thank you, Lord God, because many of us are standing right now in this room because of your image bearers that reached out to us, that helped us in our time of need. And we pray, Lord God, that we will be a mighty army in your kingdom that is daring to change this world through love, through grace, and through truth. Through your son, Jesus, by the power of in the leading of your Holy Spirit. We speak it right now in Jesus' precious name. Everybody said amen. 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 God bless you. We love you. Have a happy fourth weekend. And remember what you heard in here. Do out there. We love you.